Thank you very much. Hi, can you hear me okay? Sounds good. Right, who am I? Yep, so I'm Scott. Hi. Um, I'm a uh, video game programmer from Brighton um, and uh, sort of in my free time I make music um, under the name Cutlasses. Um, and I'm pretty terrible at DIY around the house. Um, I've never really been very good at that and in fact that sort of put me off doing a lot of these things to begin with. But I've still managed to do some things and make some instruments um, and uh, yeah I'm pretty much a novice uh, electronics really I'm only just learning so um, if I'm lying about anything I'm saying just shout out and uh, I can probably correct the slide live and we can uh, um, update it um, but yeah I'm really just going to try and talk about the things that I've learned and picked up and kind of why I found the whole process really exciting um, and hopefully like if, if it's something that you're interested in but you're not doing it at the moment like inspire you to do it because um, it, it really is um, quite easy to get started and once you've got started it's sort of a bit like a drug um, so why why would you bother making DIY instruments well the first thing is that you may come up with something completely unique uh, to you and so um, in your performance um, or however you're using it no one else has got one, no one else is going to get quite that same sound. Um, and I was at a talk by Helen Lee yesterday and she said that one of the things that she liked about DIY instruments was the fact that when you'd made something, you were the only one who had it, therefore you were the best person at playing that instrument. And I think that's, that's really great because um, I don't pretend to be an amazing musician. So if I can master the things that I've made myself, then yeah, that, that's a, a nice angle on it. Um, so yeah, they can be experimental and inspired to do other things. I quite often use them. I'll just mess around with things I've built and record it and then go back to it and kind of cut it up. So it can inspire you to do things that you wouldn't just do, uh, say, in your computer. Sometimes you can save money. Um, sometimes it's cheaper. Generally, it's probably not, especially when you've started getting obsessed by it and buying all the stuff. Um, it's probably not cheaper, but it, it can be. Um, and you can learn lots of new skills. Um, I've certainly learned loads of stuff that I didn't know about before. Right, so how do we get started? We've decided we want to make some instruments. Well, what do we have to do? Well, the first thing is get yourself a, a half-decent soldering iron. You don't need to spend a huge amount of money, but I would advise not just getting those super cheap ones with a plug and a soldering iron on the end. Something where you can temperature control it, it should be absolutely fine. Practice your soldering. Um, you're going to get loads of problems in all sorts of areas, so if you can make your soldering good enough that that isn't the problem, then that will... Um, uh, that, that will certainly make things simpler when you're debugging things. Um, yes, yeah, start simple with your soldering. Um, just get some kits and wires. I mean, it's cheap, but a lot of you here are already building things or, or, or good solderers anyway. But um, if you're not, just, yeah, you, can, you can't really go wrong. Just get some cheap kits or just solder some components together and just practice. There's loads of YouTube videos about it. Um, so just give it a go. It's, it's, it, it feels daunting. Uh, and I remember getting very frustrated the first few times I tried, but you can get it and it, it, it's not too difficult. So what other things we need? Well, a decent, semi-decent multimeter. Uh, if you get an auto-ranging one, that's useful um, because you don't need to know the rough resistance of a resistor. If, you're, if that's what you're checking, you can just, um, uh, it, will, it will find that for you. Um, some snips, so that's like another five pounds. A digital micrometer. I didn't even know what one of those was until quite recently, but they're very useful uh, just for measuring when you're building things, seeing how far apart things are, and or the the, the diameter of like a, a pot shaft or whatever. They're really useful. Um, that little picture there is called a helping hands, and it's just sort of you can just use it to hold things while you're soldering. And again, they're about five pounds. And eBay is your friend in this situation. Um, you can get, especially if you're prepared to wait for things to come from China, you can get things super cheap. So I am going to talk about this book briefly. Uh, it's a book that sort of got me into it. It's called Handmade Electronic Music, The Arts of Hardware Hacking. Uh, it's by a guy called Nicholas Collins, and I think it's amazing. And if you are interested at all in getting started, then read that book um, because it's really inspirational. Um, yeah, it's a great book, um, and it covers a variety of different projects that you can do um, from really simple um, to much more complicated but it always sort of ties it back into the history of electronic music and it sort of gave me a good understanding of like where these things had come from and what artists used them and how they got started so that I found that really interesting as well because it wasn't something I knew that much about 
Um, and so, yeah, it's certainly where I nicked most of my initial ideas in this presentation from. So um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is a contact mic. So does anyone, how, who knows what a contact mic is? Right, most of you. OK. So um, basically, it's probably the simplest thing that you can make. You can make one for a fiver. Uh, you just get these things called piezoelectric discs. Um, so that basically means um, piezoelectricity is just electricity from pressure, essentially. So um, they've got a small crystal or ceramic element. And when they're um, crushed or vi uh, vibrated, uh, they generate electricity. So uh, uh, the sound vibration will generate electricity. So the interesting thing about contact mics is that because they are picking up vibrations through solid materials, you don't get any of the sound of the room. So you don't hear any reverb. Um, and it's a very, very dry sound. So it sort of sounds unlike you would have ever heard that sound because um, you, you, you can never hear something without it passing through some air. So that means you can get some really interesting sounds out of them. Uh, yeah, I'll just put a note here to say if you do build one, make sure you use a high impedance input on your, um, in your preamp or your audio interface. But yeah, so they're really, really simple to build. Um, you can build one in half an hour once you've, you know, you've practised. Um, you just need a, a um, piezoelectric disc. They are pence from eBay. Um, some shielded audio cable and, and a, a jack. And that's it. And you basically solder the, um, you see in that diagram that the center of the disc is the, is the hot and the outer is the cold. And you just solder the hot to the tip and the cold to the other part of the jack. And that's it. And you can do that in a couple, you know, literally half an hour of that. And um, you can make some really cool sounds. Um, so I've, there's, I've just mic'd up a bottle of beer. Um, with a condenser mic and a contact mic, just to kind of get different sounds. But you can attach them to all sorts of things and hit them or scrape them and bang them, and uh, you'll get all these kind of sounds that you that you won't get any in any other way. Um, I also coated mine in this stuff called Plasti Dip, which I later found out is highly toxic. So um, <laughs> I didn't find it out by being ill. Someone just told me. Um, so be careful if you do buy that. But it's it's really good. You can sort of dip your um, contact mic in that. And um, it looks like this when you do, and so it's waterproof um, reasonably. And um, yeah, you can sort of attach it to things. Um, che uh, cheese graters are always good. Um, and there's a bit of corrugated card that I can just sort of scrape and make these sounds. Um, so this is this image here is I uh, went did a field recording course at New Haven Fort and found this huge. Um, iron kind of pipe, I don't know what it was for, with this sort of grating in front of it. I managed to wedge a contact mic in between the grating and the pipe and then just bow it with a violin bow. And it sounded amazing. I don't know if hopefully this will work. Um, are we getting any sound? There we go. Now you couldn't hear anything when you were just bowing it. but you And that's completely unprocessed. So I've actually used this in some of my own uh, recordings and then processed it. But even as a completely dry signal, it just sounds like unlike anything. And it certainly doesn't sound anything like that when through the air, you know, what I was listening to. Yeah. So I, I don't know, maybe that sounds horrible to you, but I really like that sound. So um, another thing that um, contact mics are used for is reverb, spring reverbs, um, which is like a really early form of reverb. Uh, you get that kind of like twangy surf guitar sound out of them. And that's basically just in its simplest form. Uh, I didn't make these ones, but um, that's just a contact mic going through, uh, sorry, a speaker driving um, a spring attached to a contact mic. So basically, the sound comes out the speaker, vibrates the spring, and gets picked up by the contact mic but there's a delay, so you get that kind of like shimmering um, delay. And you can see a couple of people have built one in a shoebox or whatever that is. And then just another, so I'm just trying to sort of cover some really simple things that you can do to kind of get you started. And these, all of these are sort of referenced in that book. Um, but another thing that I did um, was you can just get, take the tape head out of an old tape player and wire it directly to a jack. 
and then you can actually rub that across tapes and credit cards is a good one, anything that's magnetic, and you can get these kind of weird sort of scratching, a bit like kind of uh, scratching a record player kind of sounds out of them. And it's, it's um, yeah, they're cool. So those are all the kind of things that are pretty easy to, you know, you can make. And you, for me, that was the thing that went, oh, I made something that did work. Um, and that's sort of, once you've got something working, then you've got sort of in, inspiration to sort of go on somewhere else. So I think once you've done that, um, a good what I did anyway, and I think worked quite well, is to just start building some kits. So um, there, there's lots of cheap synth kits around. Uh, there's a company called Thonk who do much more expensive Euro rack kits, um, which are great, and I built a bunch of those. Um, and then there are like uh, smaller companies making their own kits, so 64 Pixels um, and Racket, and also Lush projects, but I think that they're not actually making any at the moment, so um, maybe concentrate on the first two. Um, but yeah, those those are great. And um, the one I started with was the Atari Punk console, um, which is really simple to build. Um, it sounds, well, to my ears, it sounds amazing. I think to most people's ears, it sounds very annoying. Um, but um, yeah, so so that that's that's the kit that that comes in, and you can build that in a couple of hours, and it and it, and it sounds great. Um, and I'm going to be doing a performance uh, tomorrow here, um, and I'll be showing off some of these things, and you, you'll be able to hear them in a bit more detail. So, once you've built your uh, your kit or or the thing you design yourself, then you need to start thinking about well, I've, I want to protect it um, so that it's going to last. If I want to take it to performance, I can't just well, maybe you can take the PCB with wires coming out of it, but it's nice to have it uh, safe. So there's lots of ways of doing this. There's, um, you can buy like guitar pedal cases, and some of them come pre-painted. Um, you can repurpose a box that already exists, or you can get something laser cut or 3D printed. And I've seen a bunch of 3D printers and, uh, and <laughs> since I've been here, so I'm sure that a lot of you know about all this stuff already. Uh, this is an enclosure I made out of a mustard tin. Um, they're really cute and they're really nice size to use. It's just a little MIDI controller. I now have loads of mustard powder that I'm struggling to get through. Uh, but um, yeah, they're, they're, they're nice little enclosures. So that's what I did with my um, Atari Punk console, just in a little um, uh, moisturizer tub, um, which, I'll, which I'll show off um, tomorrow. Uh, and that funny Christmas tree looking thing, which I didn't know what it was, is a hole cutter. They're super useful. So, um, sort of, so I'd, I'd done a bit of this sort of tinkering around with things, and um, you know, I enjoyed it, but I, I, I sort of then, you know, didn't really know where to go from there. Um, and I was doing some live stuff uh, with with laptop and guitar, um, sort of, um, and field recordings and processing them. And um, I really wanted to be able to use my feet because my hands were full of guitar. Um, so I went to try and find one. And I realized there's actually quite a dearth of, of small ones because I wanted to be able to fit everything in, in one bag when I was doing a gig. And there's that absolutely huge one. It's about this big, um, did not fit the bill. Um, and there, there just didn't seem to be any that, that really fitted the, what, I, what I needed it for. So I thought, I actually bought one from, I think it was from Japan, just the guy who had made them. And that was really small. It sort of fitted the bill, but you couldn't program it and it didn't match what I needed it to do. So I took it apart and I was like, yeah, it looks quite simple. And I'd heard about um, Arduino and things like that. I thought, well, maybe I can have a go at this. So um, yeah, so I started um, reading about Arduino and development boards. And um, I think this was where I started to really get into the whole idea of, you know, as soon as you, as I say, once you do something and it works, it just sort of inspires you to do the next thing. And when that works, you can just get a bit more complicated each time. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm guessing that most of you know um, about Arduino. I mean, how many of you know Arduino? Yeah, pretty much everyone. Okay. So, um, yeah, so you all know about Arduino, and there's other, other ones that exist um, Teensy, uh, BeagleBoard. There's, there's lots of different dev boards, um, and you can program in C or C, which is good for me because that's what I do as a job. So, it's like, okay, I, can do, I know I can do that bit. Will I be able to do the hardware bit? So, I actually concentrated on Teensy. Um, which is uh, Arduino compatible. It's really small, so it will fit inside a small enclosure. Um, and I'd say it's probably more suitable to doing USB MIDI than the Arduino, just because it sort of supports that out of the box. They're pretty cheap. 
Um, I think they're about twenty pounds. And in fact, there's there's an even cheaper version called the LC, which if you're just doing MIDI, um, is absolutely fine for that. So that it can be even cheaper. So that's the data sheet for it. Um, it's the 32-bit ARM chip. So ARM, as you, I'm sure you'll know, is what's in most of our phones. Um, and you can program it in C. And it's got a bunch of analog and digital ins and outs, which is basically what we need. So it has a really simple C interface, which you all know as, as Arduino programmers. Um, you, you can just say digital right. Here's the pin number. I'd like to set that high, please. And that pin will output a high voltage on, basically 5 volts or whatever the, the voltage supply is. Um, and so I prototyped all of that on solderless breadboard, uh, which is what that is there. And the good thing about that is that because it's all very low, vo low voltage, you can sort of just hack it around and hot plug it till it works, basically, because generally you well, I would have got something wrong and be like, OK, why doesn't that work? And you don't have to worry about you know, getting a shock or anything. Um, so that, that's just a very simple version with um, four LEDs, but without the switches. So, so that's pretty much the schematic for this MIDI pedal that I made. Uh, it's just four switches and um, five LEDs. And they're all just red in code. And so it's, it was really simple once I sort of breadboard it out. It's like, OK, I can do this. It's, it's quite easy. Um, so it's f basically four um, guitar pedal switches, um, some LEDs, uh, and then the code I wrote, which is pretty short, really. Um, and I'm now, now I've programmed it, I can configure it to do whatever I want. And I can tie it into my performance and make things work as I need them to work. So um, yeah, so that's um, also I put in, so there's four LEDs for when you press the pedals. There's also one for MIDI clock, so I can see the clock, which I still haven't decided whether that's a good thing or not, because it is quite useful to know the time, but also it's really annoying if you're playing in a dark stage, because it's all you can see. And um, I put really low resistance on the LEDs, so it's like blindingly bright. Um, but yes, I don't know if that was a good idea yet. Um, so yeah, I put, just mounted it on VeraBoard. Um, and I bought a pre-painted guitar pedal enclosure and made myself a little drill hole schematic in, in Inkscape. Um, and it looked like that. I don't know how well you can see that, but that's just before I drilled it. Uh, and there I am drilling it um, at a very slanty angle. Um, I hope that wasn't actually how I drilled it. Um, maybe I just did that for a photo, I'm not sure. Uh, I now have a drill press, uh, which is one of my best investments. Uh, and that certainly makes that a lot easier because I had a very sweary day one afternoon when trying to drill something and snapped a drill bit. And um, yes, that's when I got a drill press. So um, yeah, so there it is on VeraBoard. I'm not sure why I use such incredibly long wires. Um, yeah, so this was quite a long time. This is a few years ago. And I, yeah, I'm not sure why I did that. But um, it works. And I, there it is finished. Um, and it still works now. So that. Um, Sort of, yeah. So it gives me this level of control, as I said, and it's it's pretty short in terms of code. So and all this stuff's on GitHub. So anything that you want to read about, um, it's all up there. And I'll put this presentation up there as well. Um, so yes. Yeah, so in terms of things I learned from building that was, yeah, get a hole cutter. Don't try and use massive drill bits. That's not a good idea. Um, keep it buy enough components so you can keep a working prototype. Um, don't. Uh, harvest your prototype to build the um, your final product because then when it doesn't work you don't have anything to refer to. These are things all learned from experience. Um, yes, and when you're making a drill sheet, bear in mind that the drill sheet might be two-dimensional, but the thing is actually three-dimensional. So where I'd put my holes to drill the switches was actually also where I drilled the hole to put the USB and they basically occupied the same space, um, which doesn't really work. Luckily. I managed to fiddle it around till it worked, but yes, so think about that. Um, also, uh, this is a very specific bit of advice, but um, don't flash your Teensy through an unpowered USB hub because it will um, brick it. And I just, I mean, you can, it's fine, you can flash it again directly, but it just took me ages to work out that's what had gone wrong. So, once I'd um, sort of got my confidence up and built, built this MIDI pedal, it's like, oh, this is cool, I can build stuff, it's going to be fun. Um, so, I heard about Eurorack, and I don't know how many of you are aware of Eurorack. Show of hands for Eurorack. OK, still quite a lot of you. So yes, yeah, so it's a modular synth format. Um, 
and I really like the look of it. It's it's very visually interesting. Although I find all the cables sort of upset my OCD a little bit. I find I, I like I prefer the look of them when there where there's no cables plugged into them. Um, but that's just me. Um, but they are super expensive. Um, so this isn't mine. <laughs> but um, yeah, so there, there's someone's uh, modular synth. I imagine there's tens of thousands of pounds worth of um, equipment there. So um, yeah, so I sort of decided that. If I was going to do any stuff in Eurorack, that I was going to have to DIY it because um, a it would make it a bit cheaper, but also I'd get the fun of building it, and um, it, you know it would um, because I built it myself. I thought maybe I'd, I would use it a bit more or get a bit more invested to it, which I think it did, and that that worked. So I I got a couple of kits from Thonk. Um, but I really wanted to make my own module, uh, and I like the idea of doing the whole process of, you know, making the hardware, designing the panel, um, and sort of get, you know, um, being involved in, in each process. So I started with this kit called the Radio Music, uh, which is by a chap called Tom Whitwell, who does a um, uh, music thing, and. Um, it's inspired by John Cage and Carl Stockhausen's radio compositions. So you kind of you can put audio onto an SD card, and it will sort of cut between the audio. And that, how it does that is controlled by uh, control voltage that's going into it. And that's Teensy based. So I was like, okay, I know about Teensy. I sort of understand that. And from building that, I suddenly learned a whole load of new stuff. I was like, okay, that's how the, that's how you'd get power to the Teensy, right? Okay, oh, that's what a voltage regulator is, right? Okay, um, and so just building these kits, I sort of slowly started to learn what these things were for. Um, and I've now written my own firmware for the radio music, um, which is basically a piano player. So um, it has uh, um, a single piano sample that it then plays um, based pitch based on the control voltage. So you can kind of give it. Um, basically play it like a piano, a very, very lo-fi, slightly crap sounding piano. But it does have reverb on it and um, it, it sounds it sounds good enough. So once I'd done this, I sort of started to get a little bit obsessed by Teensies. Um, and uh, when I found out they had this audio library, I really sort of, it kind of keyed into um, the things that I like, which are like programming, tick, electronics, yes, yeah, sound, composition, yeah. Okay, so I sort of really bought into making stuff on, on the Teensy. Um, so uh, I'm gonna, I've made a bunch of different audio effects for Teensy. I'm just going to look at one that I made, which I've called the Audio Freeze. Uh, that's a picture of the Teensy Audio Shield. Um, so it's got kind of CD quality audio. Um, and But actually, I don't tend to use that now. I tend to just use the, um, the DAC that comes with it, which is really lo-fi. But for the stuff I'm doing, it sort of sounds fine. Um, so I wanted to make an effect that could manipulate live audio. Um, and Teensy's got a fairly limited amount of memory, 64K, which I think in the kind of microprocessor world of these tiny little dev boards is actually quite a lot, but, but for doing audio is, is not very much. So I thought, well, 64K doesn't give me very much room for sampling. Uh, I'll just work on like really tiny buffers, like kind of granular synthesis. So, um, the, I had a 50k buffer, which is about half a second of sound if you're recording it at 16-bit, or about a second in 8-bit. Um, I found 8-bit to be a bit too noisy, so I tended to use a smaller buffer. Um, and so essentially, it's just constantly sampling the audio as it comes in, uh, and you hit the freeze button, and then it will just play back that tiny loop. Um, so this is a rather crude diagram of it. So the, that, the buffer there is represented by that cassette tape. Um, and essentially, so the audio is coming in and going out all the time, but as soon as you hit the freeze, it's then playing that buffer back. And then uh, you can then use the controls on it to move a smaller window within that buffer. So you can, you can kind of, and you can adjust the size of that. So that's what that looked like when I um, uh, breadboarded that up. Um, and uh, so I'd, I'd used Veriboard before, um, and that had worked OK. Um, and it's cheap, and and you know, but it's it becomes more fiddly when you want to make something reasonably complicated. Um, but I found out that you can actually have PCBs manufactured very cheaply, and I always assumed that that was something you'd have to have a thousand done or whatever, and it would cost you thousands of pounds. Um, but now that is actually something you can do. And um, 
obviously you can also etch your own PCBs, which I have had a go at, which was complete disaster. Um, I'm going to have another go at it, but um, at the moment I've just been um, uh, etching my, uh, sorry, designing my own. So there's this bit of software uh, called Eagle, um, which allows you to um, design PCBs. Um, it's free. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's still a free version. There's a maximum PCB size, um, but for my stuff, that's that's been ample. Um, so I said the UI is somewhat unorthodox. I think that's probably being quite kind. Uh, it felt a bit like, to me, like the person who, or the people who'd written it, hadn't ever used any other software with a user interface before. It sort of eschews every paradigm that I've ever kind of um, found in software. And everything you think you should be able to do, that's not how you do it. Um, but once you learn it, um, you know, you kind of get to grips with it. It's very powerful. So you sort of draw out your schematic and you add all the components. Uh, and that's the schematic for the first version of the audio freeze. Um, and that's the teensy is, is the big rectangle and the other things are the, the LEDs and the um, audio jacks and, and such. Um, and then when you've got your schematic, then you can turn that into a uh, PCB. So you sort of lay out all your components and then you play this game that sort of feels like it should be an indie puzzle video game where you have to get all of the tracks to line up without crossing over any of the other tracks. And that's actually quite fun uh, until you've spent about five hours on it and you realize, oh, there's no way I can get this one to here, which is the last one I need to connect up. Um, but yeah, you do it and, and it's fun. So basically, Eagle produces these things called Gerber files, uh, which you're going to have manufactured pretty cheaply. The as I said, the fabrication is not expensive. It's about three pounds a board. And in fact, I've actually found places now that are cheaper than that. Uh, and you can have like a minimum of 10 or sometimes even five boards. So you don't have to spend a huge amount of money. Um, it took about a month for these to arrive. Um, but there are so that you can pay more um, and have them sort of delivered more quickly. Um, and as soon as you can make your own PCBs, you can be a lot more ambitious about what you make. Um, and also you can sort of, and there's loads of kind of schematics um, online that you can find that you can learn from. So yeah, so once I started doing that and making my own PCBs, that's, you know, sort of really started accelerating. Um, so on all these uh, Eurac modules, they have sort of a, a fascia um, and the PCB normally sits behind that fascia. Um, and the, that is then mounted into your case. Um, and most most modules that you buy um, commercially use metal panels, but um, I didn't have that. Um, but I so I used a laser cutter, and I just basically laser cut acrylic. Um, and I'm sure all of you know about laser cutters, but you can create a vector image, pipe that over to the laser cutter, and it will go and cut it out for you. Uh, and I was very lucky to know a generous friend who had a laser cutter um, who let me use his, um, which was very useful. Um, but there are other sites uh, like Pinoco um, where you can have uh, send off your files and they'll send you the uh, laser cut item in the post. Um, so that's the vector image. I'm not sure how well you can see that. Um, but essentially, the color dictates where it's going to cut or whether it's going to. Um, sort of engrave rather than cut. Um, and then I, I use the PCB I designed in Eagle to, to lay out where everything should be so that I knew the PCB was where the, the components were so I could lay that out as a layer in Inkscape and, and fit everything around that. Um, so there it is cutting and uh, it's quite an amazing thing when you've sort of designed something entirely digitally and then this magical robot cuts it out for you and just watching it is like it's totally mesmerizing uh, and, and that was really cool I've covered it there in uh, masking tape uh, and you'll see why in a second so um, so that's just acrylic covered in masking tape um, and uh, I then sort of painted over it so um, and then peeled off the masking tape and then it looked like that so um, that and those are the, the controls on there. But I've got a video uh, which should have time to play, so it's not very long. So hopefully this is just this is actually a more up to date version of the audio freeze. It's got a larger buffer and it's can do more, but hopefully this will work. So that's a contact mic that's picking up the kalimba and putting it into uh, a preamp and then going straight into the audio freeze. Thank you. 
Yeah, so all that's taken from a video that I made that's on YouTube. So if you're interested in those weird sounds, then um, you can check them out there. So you can build your own one of these if you want. Um, all the files are on GitHub, um, and the, including the Gerbers and the schematics. So if you want to build one, then you can. Um, and also, because it's Teensy-based, you can program it to do something better or different. Uh, so. Yeah, so I've done a little bit on the um, the 3.2, which is the one that's got 64K. Then the 3.5 came out, and that was really exciting because I had four times as much memory, a whole 256 kilobytes of RAM, which is a, which is a massive amount. Um, and at the faster cores, you can kind of do more. And they've got floating point hardware. So um, to get stuff working on the 3.2 when I was trying to do DSP, or digital signal processing, um, I had to write my own fixed point library to to do the the math quickly enough to get it to work um but on the teensy um you'd have to do that um it's got a built-in floating point unit um yeah so that really allowed me to do a lot more digital signal processing um and so then i sort of went a bit nuts and made loads so um well i say loads four um so uh, yeah so I've, I've i've sort of made a little suite of them this is the kind of more up-to-date audio freeze um in a much more reduced size panel um which is here um and so it's just sort of like um two layers of pcb um so it's, just so it's narrower and uses up a bit less space in the case um so there it is from the side um, and so yeah that, that pcb i just had um printed and it, it comes in the post and it's um it's a really cool thing and say when you've, you've designed something digitally and there it's been physically manifested and given to you it's it's great um so yeah so i've made a bunch of other effects i've made something called the glitch delay uh which is sort of similar to audio freeze it's sort of like a delay that's playing lots of tiny little buffers jumping about um, at different pitches so you can kind of um, and then you can sort of blend those sounds together uh, there's videos of that on youtube uh, the chrono crusher as i call it which is basically just a delay um, and some reverb and a bit crusher at the end so um, you can sort of get like really lo-fi delay sounds uh, and i wrote the um, this piano player for radio music um, and yeah all the codes and schematics are on github as i say they're all open source you can take them and do what you like with them um so this is a case that i built to house them all in just made out of a, a, a lunch box that i found on the internet um so i just put some wood into it uh to make the bars to uh screw the um panels into and that's just a little um power supply that the, the kind of the power supply bit is actually pre-made and i just wired that into some variable to put the connectors into 
so yeah so there's a bunch of the ones i've made um housed and i've, I've used aluminium paddles there now i've got my drill press i can drill things more easily with uh, less swearing um and uh yeah so that that's there is the uh glitch delay the chrono crusher and the audio freeze all together and that other module sort of uh, guitar preamp so i can put my guitar through these um yeah so final thoughts um yeah so i'd say if you're interested in building stuff then do it because i mean obviously we're all makers of, of some description but if, if particularly if you're interested in building instruments i definitely go for it um it's it's really rewarding as i say getting something in the post that you've made digitally is great just sort of having an idea and then weeks and weeks later finally you've got something is great and with the internet it makes everything so much easier um so i've focused primarily on the teensy uh just because that was what i was into but there's other, obviously, ways of doing things digitally. There's Bella and there's Raspberry Pi. Um, but also, there's analog. And there's a load more stuff that you can do uh, in the analog realm. I haven't done so much of that just because I'm not as experienced in that stuff. But um, you know, there's loads of crazy things you can do there. Uh, and often, you get a lot more kind of weird, unexpected stuff happening in analog. Um, that's often why things take so long, because the weird, unexpected things are stopping you from doing what you're trying to do. But if you're using it for audio, that, audio, that can be really cool. So, um, how do we get started? Well, as I said, practice your soldering. That's really important. I definitely recommend reading that book. Uh, I don't have any <laughs> interest in it. I don't know Nicholas Collins, but I just think it's a great book and I really recommend it. Um, build some kits. Uh, I think that's a really great way of learning things. Oh, okay. So, sorry, I've just seen my time's up. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much to, um, to uh, Electromagnetic Field. Um, I'll just, just go to the end of this so you can see where I am. So if you want to get any of this stuff, um, I'm uh, on GitHub and um, you can check out my music and some of the music that I've used to make these things. Uh, and as I said, I'm going to do a live performance tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Um, you'll be able to see all this stuff kind of being used and hear what it sounds like in a more sort of performance uh, environment. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, cheers. Thank you. I think we have time for one quick question. If there's someone who has a question, please raise your hand. Okay, so I guess you're just going to have to mob him after. Thank you very much. Thanks.